let's finish reading the Diamond Sutra, the William Gemmel version that I began uh, some videos ago. It's in uh, a special file on my uh, channel, the Diamond Sutra, by William Gemmel. And this is his version. It's beautifully written. And I left off at page 99. So let's just finish it. Page 99. We'll go back to 98. Saputi thereupon inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honoured of the worlds, in what respect are enlightened disciples unaffected by considerations of reward or merit? That is, they're not attached, are they? They're not attached. And they're not egoic, and they're not and their non-dualist. The Lord Buddha replied, saying, Enlightened disciples do not aspire in the spirit of covetousness to rewards commensurate with their merit. Therefore, I declare that they are entirely unaffected by considerations of reward or merit. So they're not attached, are they? Oops, where are we? Oops, it continues. The Lord Buddha addressed Saputi, saying, If a disciple asserts that the Lord Buddha comes or goes, sits or reclines, obviously he has not understood the meaning of my discourse. And why? Because the idea Buddha implies, n oops, implies neither coming from anywhere nor going to anywhere, and hence the synonym Buddha. Neither coming from anywhere nor going to anywhere. That's non-dual, really, isn't it? It's like saying that something is hot and cold at the same time. Mm. The Lord Buddha addressed Saputi, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, were to take infinite worlds and reduce them to minute particles of dust, what, think you, would the aggregate of all those particles of dust be great? Saputi replied, saying, Honoured of the worlds, the aggregate of all those particles of dust would be exceedingly great. And why? Because if all those were in reality minute particles of dust, the Lord Buddha would not have declared them to be minute particles of dust. And why? Because the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon minute particles of dust, declared that in reality those are not minute particles of dust, they are merely termed minute particles of dust. This is all paradoxical, isn't it? And it's meant to shake us out of our dualism. But logical people would tell you that it's not possible to be <laughs> non-dualist. And uh, it's not possible to be without an ego. And I suppose they'd probably say it's uh, not possible to be not attached to things. So Puti, continuing, addressed the Lord Buddha, saying, Honoured of the world, what the Lord Buddha discoursed upon as infinite worlds, these are not in reality infinite worlds. They are merely termed infinite worlds. And why? Because if these were in reality infinite worlds, there would of necessity be unity and eternity of matter. But the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon the unity and eternity of matter, declared that there is neither unity nor eternity of matter. Therefore, it is merely termed unity and eternity of matter. The Lord Buddha thereupon declared unto Saputi, Belief in the unity or eternity of matter is incomprehensible, and only common, worldly-minded people, for purely materialistic reasons, covet this hypothesis. The Lord Buddha addressed Saputi, saying, If a disciple affirmed that the Lord Buddha enunciated a belief that the mind can comprehend the idea of an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality, what think you, Saputi? Would that disciple be interpreting aright the meaning of my discourse? Saputi replied, saying, Honoured of the worlds, that disciple would not be interpreting aright the meaning of the Lord Buddha's discourse. And why? Because, honoured of the worlds, discoursing upon comprehending such ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality, it was declared that these are entirely unreal and elusive, and therefore they are merely termed an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. The Lord, have, we, have you really got an ego? Have I got an ego? The Lord Buddha thereafter addressed Saputi, saying, Those who aspire to the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom ought thus to know, believe in, 
My screen just went black. Those who aspire to the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom ought thus to know, believe in, and interpret phenomena. They ought to eliminate from their minds every tangible evidence of every visible object. Saputi, concerning visible objects, the Lord Buddha declared that these are not really visible objects, they are merely termed visible objects. The Lord Buddha addressed Saputi, saying, If a disciple, having immeasurable spheres filled with the seven treasures, bestow, filled with the seven treasures, bestowed these in the exercise of charity, and if a disciple, whether man or woman, having aspired to supreme spiritual wisdom, selected from this scripture a stanza comprising four lines, then rigorously observed, observed it, studied it, and diligently explained it to others, the cumulative merit of such a disciple would be relatively greater than the other. In what attitude of mind should it be diligently explained to others? I'm trying to explain it to you and to myself at the same time. In what attitude of mind should it be diligently explained to others? Not assuming the permanency or the reality of earthly phenomena, but in the conscious blessedness of a mind at perfect rest. And why? Because the phenomena of life may be likened unto a dream, a phantasm, a bubble, a shadow, the glistening dew, or lightning flash and thus they ought to be contemplated. When the Lord Buddha con concluded his enunciation of this scripture, the venerable Saputi, the monks, nuns, lay brethren and sisters, all mortals, and the whole realm of spiritual beings, rejoiced exceedingly, and consecrated to its practice, they received it and departed. That's the end of the Diamond Sutra. Uh, the, trans Oops, pull this. the translation by William Gemmell. And there's a little poem at the end. As when men, travelling, feel a glorious perfume sweet, pervading all the countryside, and gladdening them, infer at once, surely tis giant forest trees are flowering now. So, conscious of this perfume, sweet of righteousness, that now pervades the earth and heavens, they may infer, a Buddha, infinitely great, must once have lived. And when I finish the Diamond Sutra, I always start again from the beginning. And I'll just read a little to get myself going into the next for my next reading. The Diamond Sutra by William Gemmell. Thus have I heard concerning our Lord Buddha. Upon a memorable occasion, the Lord Buddha sojourned in the kingdom of Shravasti, lodging in the grove of Jetta, a park within the imperial domain, which Jetta, the heir apparent, bestowed upon Sutana, a benevolent minister of state, renowned for his charities and benefactions. With the Lord Buddha there were assembled together twelve hundred and fifty mendicant disciples, all of whom had attained to eminent degrees of spiritual wisdom. As it approached the hour for the morning meal, Lord Buddha, honoured of the worlds, attired himself in a mendicant's robe, and bearing an alms bowl in his hands, walked towards the great city of Shravasti, which he entered to beg for food. Within the city he proceeded from door to door, and received such donations as the good people severally bestowed. Concluding this religious exercise, the Lord Buddha returned to the grove of Jetta, and partook of the frugal meal received as alms. Thereafter he divested himself of his mendicant's robe, laid aside the vener venerated alms bowl, bathed his sacred feet, and accepted the honoured seat reserved for him by his disciples. Upon that occasion, the venerable Saputi occupied a place in the midst of the assembly. Rising from his seat, with cloak arranged in such manner that his right shoulder was disclosed, like that, yes, Saputi knelt upon his right knee, then pressing together the palms of his hands, he respectfully raised them towards Lord Buddha, saying, Thou art of transcendent wisdom, honoured of the worlds. With wonderful solicitude thou dost preserve in the faith and instruct in the law this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Honoured of the worlds, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeks to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, 
what immutable law shall sustain the mind of that disciple and bring into subjection every inordinate desire? The Lord Buddha replied to Saputi, saying, Truly a most excellent theme, as you affirmed, I preserve in the faith and instruct in the law this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Attend diligently unto me, and I shall enunciate a law whereby the mind of a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeking to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, shall be adequately sustained and enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire. Saputi was gratified and signified glad consent. Thereupon the Lord Buddha, with majesty of person and perfect articulation, proceeded to deliver the text of this scripture, saying, By this wisdom shall enlightened disciples be enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire, every species of life, whether hatched in the egg, formed in the womb, evolved from spawn, produced by metamorphosis, with or without form or intelligence, possessing or devoid of natural instinct, from these changeful conditions of being, I command you to seek deliverance in the transcendental concept of nirvana. Thus, that is, nirvana is a transcendental concept, we've transcended dualism, egoity, and attachment, haven't we? Thus, you shall be delivered from an immeasurable, innumerable, and illimitable world of sentient life, but in reality there is no world of sentient life from which to seek deliverance. And why? Because in the minds of enlightened disciples there have ceased to exist such arbitrary concepts of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. Moreover, this is about non egoity moreover, Saputi, an enlightened disciple ought to act spontaneously in the exercise of charity, uninfluenced by sensuous phenomena, such as sound, odor, taste, touch, or law. Saputi, it is imperative that an enlightened disciple, in the exercise of charity, should act independently of phenomena. That is, unattached, isn't it? And why? Because, acting without regard to elusive forms of phenomena, he will realize in the exercise of charity a merit inestimable and immeasurable. Saputi, what think you? Is it possible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space? Saputi replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, it is impossible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space. The Lord Buddha thereupon discoursed, saying, It is equally impossible to estimate the merit of an enlightened disciple who discharges the exercise of charity unperturbed by the seductive influences of phenomena. Saputi, the mind of an enlightened disciple ought thus to be indoctrinated. The Lord Buddha interrogated Saputi, saying, What think you? Is it possible that by means of his physical body the Lord Buddha may be clearly perceived? Saputi replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, it is impossible that by means of his physical body the Lord Buddha may be clearly perceived. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as a physical body is in reality not merely a physical body. Thereupon the Lord Buddha addressed Saputi, saying, Every form or quality of phenomena is transient and elusive when the mind realizes that the phenomena of life are not real phenomena, the Lord Buddha may then be clearly perceived. I think I'll stop there now, having finished uh, the third part and having begun the sutra over again. No, very nice sutra, very beautifully written by William Gemmell. That's part three of my readings uh, and the conclusion of the Diamond Sutra by William Gemmell. See ya.